I'd like to welcome our next speaker on stage, Karan. Hey. So uh, Karan is a CTO and co-founder of SoStrong. He is the creator of Embed.io. He helped organize the first uh, GopherCon. I think and the other one is uh, being displayed. He also runs yeah, close the Bangalore that. Golang Meetup Group. Uh, in his spare time, he likes to play squash, Diablo 3, and Counter-Strike, specifically Counter-Strike Go. What a coincidence. <laughs> so over to you, Karan. Can you guys hear me? All right. So let's get started. So uh, my name is Karan, and uh, I'm going to speak about uh, uh, a journey we have had uh, in the last one and a half years about uh, putting our startup or betting our startup on Go and App Engine. And uh, I'm going to try and give you guys a holistic idea of how our journey was. So uh, th that's my Twitter and GitHub, in case you guys want to get in touch, post this. So one fun fact which I wanted to share right now is, although I have done a lot of public speaking before, and I've fought a lot of battles in Reddit and Hacker News, this is the first time I'm addressing uh, this big audience. So if I start going this, right, uh, no, it's not a heart attack. It's just my stage fright. But I come prepared. Okay. So, so uh, before I start talking about this uh, specific application which we built, the product which we built, I need to give you guys a little bit of background on what is esports, right? So I'm going to show an image on screen. Raise of hands. Who who recognizes what this is? Hmm, quite a few. A lot of college kids. This is Quake 3, right? And what is this? Counter Strike. Perfect. So th these are games, right? FPS, Twitch games, first person shooters, right? So uh, this actually has gone from being something which is limited to, you know, basements and few people sitting in pajamas and playing the game to something which is like this now, right? This is an image from uh, Katowice where uh, one of the tournaments was held and we can actually fill up a stadium very easily nowadays and 40 odd people, 40 million odd people watching on Twitch and YouTube gaming. So it's pretty big now. So what we are trying to do is build an application, not a game, right? Application which lets gamers experience this, right? So we have this application, very beautiful. Uh, if you want to talk about this, then I think Shantanu is sitting somewhere there and you can talk to him. He built this one. What I'm going to talk about is the Go backend, which you know helps this particular thing run, and uh, let's get started. I know you guys can't see this, right? But I had to put an architecture diagram, right? So this is an architecture diagram, but I don't have enough time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about one specific piece, uh, which is what we call NSA, right? Uh, we do a fun thing in uh, So Strong. What we do is uh, we try and name a particular module based on what it does. So maybe my description of it will make sense why we call it NSA. Right? So let me explain a little bit about what we do. Uh, we actually have built a platform for a game called Counter-Strike Global Offensive. And it's an application, it's a game by Valve, and it's a proprietary thing. It's not open source. It doesn't have a lot of documentation as expected from a game. So what they do, do is they export everything which is happening inside the game as a UDP log stream. Right? UDP packets can be sent to one particular address, the IP and a port, and you got to do what you want to do with that, right? nothing else. And we get a control channel back, which is over TCP, which is what allows us, allows NSA in particular to control this particular game, and the other pieces. So what's written in Go in this particular equation is NSA and the API, and API is what sits in App Engine, and NSA I'll talk about more, like how it actually works. NSA is essentially a state machine which is, how do you say it, built to uh, replicate what's happening inside the Counter-Strike game server. So if a player, let's say, kills another player using an AK-47, for example, we get a log stream from that, we parse it, and based on what we parse, we essentially try and uh, replicate what's happening inside the game, inside our memory, so that we can take decisions uh, as a, a reaction to that. So if, let's say, uh, the maximum number of rounds allowed have been played already, then what we'll do is we will create a half time so that the teams can switch. And that happens using the TCP interface, right? So 
why did we choose to do it in Go? That's where the interesting bit is. So a typical startup rule is you must do it as fast as possible. And that normally involves doing it in something like uh, Ruby or Python because, hey, so many gems available out there, you'll probably get some solution or the other, right? So doing it in Go was a necessity for us because this, right? Who recognizes what the screen is? Has anybody seen this before, ever? Nobody has done this reaction test. So what I'll describe what this is, right? So you have these sheep on the left, and you, you get to shoot these arrows by clicking a mouse pointer, right? And you have to do this as fast as you can the moment the sheep leaves, right? So that's something like 200 milliseconds. I just took a screenshot after getting this, and that's supposed to be really good. It's below average. Below average is good here, by the way. Uh, so the gamers we interact with normally can get this before the guy crosses the first green line. They can react to events in 100 milliseconds because they are that good, right? So in our case, we were building something which was going to be used by gamers who are used to a very fast, twitchy response inside the game. And we could not really take a chance in building something which at times would lag. So as a result, right, we, we had to take a call initially that, hey, we're going to build this in Go, right? Uh, we will take a shot at building this in Go because, yes, we might have to build certain tools because we started doing this back in June 2014. And we had to write a couple of libraries to um, get this all to work. But what this allowed us to do is we were fast by default, right? Because in our case, milliseconds actually mattered. The Go runtime at that point, it was uh, 1.4, 1.4.1. That actually was really, really fast because uh, we were able to react to all the UDP log stream events coming to our particular uh, application, the NSA, within milliseconds. And gamers would not be uh, even aware that something is happening in the background. Right. So that was, th that was one of the major decisions. Right. So how, how did we evolve NSA over time? So when we developed this back in November 2014, the first version used something uh, which was uh, in beta back then. I think it's still in beta right now. It was called Managed VMs. Uh, it was a product uh, add-on to App Engine, uh, which is, again, something which uh, GCP, Google Cloud Platform, provides. So we, we wrote this particular uh, managed VM module, which uh, opened a UDP sync, where all the packets from the different Counter-Strike uh, servers running everywhere in the world would all gather up in. And it would do the processing. It, would, it is multi-tenant, so it would handle all these different uh, game servers. and you know, do the right TCP calls, Archon calls, to evolve the game as it required. But later on, quite late in the development cycle, we discovered that there was a major bug in uh, App Engine MVM. They did not actually handle UDP properly. I was like, whoops, that's something which we absolutely need. So we actually had to uh, create a sort of proxy server in Go again which uh, listened for packets on UDP and then moved it into a TCP channel so that we could move it into inside the MVP, MVM instance. And we got that working. But what was really bad that because of the instability, it was in beta, right? It was, just be, it was uh, just out. So because of the instability of MVM, we used to get a lot of downtime, which was affecting the gamers who were playing on our system. So we had to do something, uh, and I'll describe what we did. But one thing which was uh, very prominent that the design of this entire NSA was driven a lot by a few seminal talks which me and a uh, few of my colleagues had seen while developing this. The, the one thing which I would definitely want to uh, point out is the Advanced Concurrency Patterns talk by Samir Ajmani. The advanced concurrency talk by Samir Ajmani, which uh, demonstrated how you can use the for select loops uh, to model state machines and uh, keep it concurrent, not blocking, and all of that. And the second one was uh, the talk by Rob Pike, uh, which was called Lexical Scanning in Go, which essentially showed how you can model state machines uh, very nicely in Go itself. The second version, we had to completely ditch MVM at that point because uh, we realized that this thing is not going to go out of beta anytime soon. So while GCP 
in its current form in 2016 February is doing a lot. It's reaching out to customers. They have an insider's channel. Uh, a lot of products are coming out, like the Vision API just went out of, uh, uh, and now it's in beta. But back then, they were a little slow in responding to some of our requests. Like the UDP thing didn't get fixed for months. So what we had to do is we decided, hey, let's, let's make the multi-tenant server single tenant, right? So instead of a single NSA instance handling a lot of Counter-Strike servers, we removed one particular onion layer. Essentially, we removed that particular layer which handled uh, multiple UDP packet syncs, right? And essentially converted it into a Docker container which ran alongside the Counter-Strike server in the machine itself, right? And handled that particular game server. Why this was okay to do? Because Counter-Strike, the game itself, is extremely CPU intensive. It, uh, let's say, it, a typical Counter-Strike server uh, on which let's say 10 players are playing, right, can saturate a single core on a quad core uh, i7 uh, CPU, which might look like a massive waste of resources, right, because a, a typical i7 quad core should be able to handle maybe a 2,000 active users. But this is a different ballpark altogether. So this is what we were dealing with, right? We were pretty confident that this Go solution would not put extra memory pressure on the machine, and we were right. It did not, uh, like even currently with all the changes we have done and the, how it has evolved, it does not use more than 20 megabytes of RAM while handling the current server, which is you know filled with uh, active players. And it does not go beyond 0.1% CPU. That's how efficient it is. So we could very confidently move this into the uh, Counter-Strike server machine itself, which is outside the GCP cloud, and uh, get it running, right? And we used uh, golang.xnet context package. I think somebody spoke about this earlier today. So the context package is uh, something we heavily relied on to make this NSA uh, very, very reliable. Because we were deploying, now instead of being deployed inside the GCP cloud, where you know it is inside the Google bubble and uh, it is having the best possible networking possible, now it was being deployed across data centers in Southeast Asia where the network conditions can vary from time to time. So we needed to uh, create a solution which not only was resilient to, let's say, a few network calls going bad, it, it should be resilient or it should be able to run the game even with the entire API layer not responding for multiple minutes altogether. Because, like I said, eSports is a very consumer-friendly sport. We, we all stream the game. So you cannot explain to a million people watching the game that why your game suddenly has to be paused. So the game must go on, right? So NSA, what it does is it uses uh, a lot of cool Go, go, go features like closures to essentially create a backlog of API calls, which it will retry at a point of time after the API starts responding. And the reason why we are able to do it without breaking our heads is that something like context package allows us to set deadlines in a very elegant manner. So all our API calls going from NSA to the outside world have deadlines set on them so that we get control failure instead of not knowing when this API call is going to time out, which is always bad, right? So I just wanted to point, uh, this is the only code I have in this because I don't think anybody can actually read code uh, and understand it at the same time. So I wanted to point out this particular pattern, right, which is very prevalent in a lot of uh, concurrent code uh, which we have written, like NSA is filled with this. So I call it the for select blah 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 pattern. So what, what's inside the select doesn't really matter. What, what's really important about this is the, the, the idea that you can model a very complicated service behind a simple for loop, right? And normally the way you write these for loops, you can probably see the entire loop code in one screen of your favorite editor right? Acme, VI, Sublime Text, whatever, right? So what that means is you can, let's say, talking to your colleague at one point of time, reason that, hey, this particular variable does not have a data race because I can, by looking at this code, guarantee that this will not be accessed concurrently by another Go routine, right? So that sort of confidence uh, goes a long way in letting you create code which, uh, how do you say, uh, is guaranteed to work 
without consuming a lot of CPU resources and guaranteed to work for a long time. We never had a crash inside this loop. And God knows we have a lot of them, right? So how we got confident that this is the right way to go about it is that because, see, I, I did 10 years of uh, software before I got into this, right? And uh, like somebody mentioned before, I had almost lo lost all love for programming before that because I was tired of jumping between Java files or .NET C Sharp files to try and understand this simple logic, which was because the design patterns dictated like that, was spread across a lot of files, right? The logic was actually broken down into so many different design patterns that a normal person three months down, down the line could not understand. But in this case, we would proudly put it in one for select loop and it would stay readable, right? Because I can still understand the code I wrote one and a half years ago. So evidence is there. So we got confidence because these three guys, right? Uh, Rob Pike, in his Google I.O. 2012 talk, The Concurrency Pattern. Uh, Samir Ajmani, in his 2013 Google I.O. talk, where he gave an advanced concurrency pattern. I referred to this earlier. I, I, I highly recommend anybody who's serious about Go, please go watch this, right? And obviously, Brad Fitzpatrick and Andrew Gerand uh, doing a code share, uh, pairing session on the HTTP client implementation, right? Because when we see these guys who are part of the Go core team, uh, implement code this way, it feels that, okay, we are probably not doing something extremely naive by doing it in a similar fashion. Like we are d on the same road. So they might not write a gang of four design patterns book, but they definitely have given us a lot of evidence to fight the managers when they come asking, right? Like, hey, if they can get it working, so can we, right? So uh, th these three videos definitely must watch for anybody who interested in uh, getting serious with Go. So. Before I move on to App Engine, what I wanted to highlight is don't get scared off by what I just said, though, right? Because this is NSA, which is the complicated piece, uh, which is a state machine, and it is uh, capable of handling failure scenarios and all of that. Most of the API code which sits inside App Engine is straight line blocking code, right? I, I will probably need to look very hard to find a for select loop in there because. While Go allows you to go concurrent when you want, it also comes completely steps out of the way when you want to write just straight line blocking code. Hey, I want to load something from data store, make a call, wait for it to come back, right? Because it doesn't map every block request to a thread. You can confidently do this because I don't want to repeat this. Everybody has mentioned this before. You are very you are given the confidence to rely on Go routines because they will not kill your system because you did not write evented code manually. It becomes evented. It's, it's, yeah. it's very natural when you get down dirty with this. So for select loop is a powerful add-on available to you when you want to do it, but it's not necessary. You can write simple CRUD APIs very easily with it as well. So with App Engine, right, I wanted to uh, dedicate one particular slide to this. The reason is I don't think, OK, who else has an application on App Engine here? You can't raise your hand. Right. OK, I, I see like three hands. So who, ha who has an application on AWS here? There you go. So th that's, that's the thing I wanted to highlight right now. right? So uh, I, I keep arguing with people on why App Engine is a good choice, right? because obviously our application is on it. right? So the thing is, people go to AWS because they're like, hey, maybe this App Engine thing is not going to be powerful enough for what I want to do. Right? That's, that's, that's assumption number one. The second assumption is, hey, uh, I don't want my data to be with Google, right? Because they will do some stuff with it, right? Google doesn't care about all that data, trust me. The third, third thing is, uh, th there's going to be a, a big time. Like, I, I'll not be able to move out of from App Engine later on. So I just wanted to address these things. So we went full in on App Engine, right? Primarily because Go was natively supported in App Engine, right? Uh, back when, when we started, it was in beta. And sometime last, uh, last year, August 2015, if I remember correctly, it went out of beta and it's now globally available, right, GA. So what that means is the SDK which the Google team provides for App Engine is, is excellent, right? It has native support for context library. So all, all the fancy de uh, deadline timeout logic which you want to do, you can do. Because if you compare this to the official AWS Go SDK, okay, right. Uh, that thing is 
pure evil, right? Because uh, you do not pass strings there. You pass pointers to strings, right? Because th they went the machine generated route. And uh, when, like, I have been in the issue tracker for AWS and uh, the Go library, and trying to explain that concept to them is really hard because they're like, hey, I don't see the problem there because maybe, maybe this is the first Go project they worked on and they did not know that this is not how idiomatic Go is supposed to be like, right? Because the AW, the App Engine SDKs, they're perfectly written because uh, at no point do you feel that, oh, what am I doing right now, right? So it felt natural for us to consume the libraries because at that point, we had already made the choice of going with Go. So we had to, had to quickly get started with the library, which was written understanding Go properly. So that made a natural choice. We did not have to set up elastic load balancers, CDNs, auto-scaling groups, all the things which you need to do in EC2 or AWS to scale your solution. Because I know of a few startups, I'll not name them, who spend something like $10,000 a month on their uh, startup's infrastructure cost. But all we had to do was configure a YAML file and tell Google, hey, give me a F1 instance, keep three of them warmed up, and scale as you want, right? And it's taken care of business ever since, right? And our infrastructure costs, thankfully, are the lowest uh, in our burn rate, right? So that allows for better salaries and whatnot. So you should definitely consider App Engine, and if you're using Go, definitely, like, plus one for that. Like, don't dismiss it because it can become a big advantage for your startup or your company or your project uh, if you do it that way, right? So with that, I'd like to say thank you. And uh, any questions? Thank you. Yeah, th that's allowed. I can say that. Anything? I think you're a bit unfair in comparing App Engine to EC2. Uh, OK. Because uh, AWS supports Beanstalk and Lambda, which yes. gives you a lot of the advantages that you get with App Engine. Like not, you don't have to provision and things like that. Yes. So I just wanted to point out that. That's all. Absolutely. It is there, right? But um, OK, I, I would like to address that question. That uh, when you go into AWS, right, uh, in uh, App Engine, or in GCP, rather, things are organized by projects. and uh, I would say that there is a lot less cognitive overload to get started, particularly for a startup, because when you get started, do you ever imagine, like, I'm going to spend three weeks laying out the perfect AWS solution? Because there are training courses for that, by the way, right? So it, it's a lot more sophisticated. So with power comes a lot more extra time, which needs to be spent in designing that perfect AWS configuration, right? Yes, there is Lambda, which is, I guess, the closest equivalent of App Engine, right? But apparently, GCP has something called Cloud Functions now. So I, I don't know. I thought App Engine was Lambda. But I'm a little confused there. But yes, the argument stands. Yep. Sure. Are you uh, are you using uh, data Sorry. store? Yes, we are. OK. How do you feel? I mean, it's, uh, 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 can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, data store. Yeah. So what is your uh, uh, thoughts on data store? OK. Uh, we've had. Uh, OK, it's actually perfect for what it is meant to be. We, as a startup, again, did the mistake that uh, we were trying to use it as a backing store for something it was not meant for. Like, uh, we were trying to write into data store too often. Because it is based on big table, right? What it really excels for is uh, when you want to read something at a large scale, right? So you write once into data store, and you can read from it as often as you want. So that particular thing is taken care of for you, right? What uh, becomes painful is uh, if you try and, let's say, write into one particular entity, right, too often, like more than once a second, right? Then definitely you will uh, run into roll box, but th there, are, there are reasons why you can't write more than one write per second. So it's a design trade-off which the team has taken for us. So it, it's perfectly good for what it is meant to be used for, but it's not uh, like the silver bullet here, yeah. Yeah. So how are you managing the staging servers? Sorry? Staging servers. I can't hear you. So, uh, staging server, you want to test before putting the production. App App Engine does not have the uh, server for staging. Staging server? Uh -huh. uh, you mean how do we test QA environment and stuff like yeah. that? Yeah, sure. So it's actually pretty simple. Like I said, in uh, GCP, things are organized by project, right? 
So we have a prod project and we have a QA project, right? So we simply deploy different versions to both of these. And they stay separate because of the namespace in there, right? But in prod, they do support uh, traffic splitting. So let's say you could deploy a new version and send 20% of traffic into that and later on switch it from 20% to full 100% if you know if the error rates don't go up. That'll work out as well. Yeah. All right. I think.